thank you for inviting me. And uh, it's really nice to go around and hear something about each person in the audience and get to know uh, a little bit about you and what your interests may be. Most important thing, as I started thinking about what I was going to say today, is that since this is the traditional nap time, to try to be lively enough so that people don't slip off and take a nap. And I also see quite a few people uh, with their portable oxygen tanks, and I want to make sure that we finish up before they run out. Uh, because uh, you know, we only have so many medical resources here to provide. Uh, I thought about what, uh, how to do this, and, and uh, I thought the most uh, productive way would be to, for me is to think of questions that come up all the time that people have asked me, and uh, go through a whole bunch of questions and see if they are things that have occurred to you. Uh, you've had a whole, you, you've had a number of doctors. Yes, I'm having trouble here. Trouble here. Is this not? Is that better? Yes. yes. That's better. Thank you. Uh, you've had quite a few speakers uh, and your own doctors to hear uh, about advice, and uh, no doubt you've heard more than one opinion about different things, and that can be confusing. So uh, if you have a good memory, you'll know that you don't always get the same answer to your questions. And, uh, so this will give you another uh, version to try to uh, put together enough different answers so you can reconcile so the truth may be hidden among all, all of them. Everybody has his own version of how they handle problems or what they think are the most important issues to pay attention to. And uh, it's good for you to hear from a bunch of different people. Uh, if any questions occur to you as I'm talking, just raise your hand and we'll stop and see any questions. I don't want you to feel like you have to hold them to the end. Uh, so first of all, what, uh, what about asthma versus COPD? Well, there are different, they overlap a lot. They both are uh, different forms of obstructive lung disease. And if you're talking about obstructive lung disease, this is defined by spirometry. You probably have all heard had spirometry test, which is go to the pulmonary function lab, take a deep breath in as far as you can fill up your lungs, and then blow out as far as fast as you can. If you do not blow out uh, a large enough volume in the first second of that effort, then you have obstructive lung disease. So the, the two key measurements from that are the FVC, force vital capacity, which is the total amount of air that you can blow out, and the FEV1, which is the amount of air that comes out in the first second. You divide the amount of air that comes out in the first second by the, from the vital capacity, the total amount. And if that ratio is too small, then that's called obstructive. So if you have a small ratio, you have obstructive lung disease of some type. The difference between asthma and COPD is that if you have asthma, typically it's a disease that has good times and bad times. You have attacks and then the attacks are over. So that at some time, lung function returns to normal. It will be obstructed at some times, but then other times it comes back all the way to normal. With COPD, it never comes back to normal. So no matter how many times you have that test, night or day, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, every time you go to take the test, it's going to show obstruction. So chronic obstructive lung disease never returns to normal. And that's really the definition. Now there are different characteristics that are more typical of somebody with asthma than somebody with COPD. With asthma, you're more likely to develop it when you're young. So children frequently have asthma. Uh, in childhood, it's more common among boys than, than among girls. Uh, then as you get toward puberty, there's a time when asthma frequently disappears. It may recede as you get into teenage and young adulthood. Uh, among people past puberty, it's more common among girls than among boys. So among adults, more women have asthma than men. The reasons for those two things are not known. We really don't understand why the sex differences for children and uh, for adults. But it is more common among women than uh, among adults. <coughs> asthma is more likely to overlap with allergies. So if you're allergic to things, if you have, uh, if you're atopic, if you have skin rashes, if you have Heat fever during pollen season if you're allergic to the household pet, pet uh, particularly cats, cats are the most allergenic of all the pets you can have uh, then you're more likely to, uh, to develop uh, easy chest tightness that, uh, that goes along with asthma. Uh, you're more likely to have sinus disease, so uh, either nasal polyps or uh, chronic rhinitis, sinusitis, or just 
sinus congestion that comes that's uh, particularly bad during the allergy season. Uh, COPD, on the other hand, typically starts after age 40, and frequently it's more like uh, 50s or, or 60s. It usually occurs in somebody who has you know, spent a long time inhaling something which has done some damage to the airways. The most common, of course, is cigarettes. Uh, but it's seen in some people who have never smoked, particularly if you've worked in an area uh, where you're inhaling a lot of dust, or if you have had asthma, which has gotten to be so frequent that it almost never remits. Some people with asthma have episodes and then it goes away. A smaller percentage of people with asthma have times that are worse than other times, but even the good times are not so good. And they never get completely opened up and so that their breathing feels normal again. Uh, so if you've had a, a lifetime of asthma that was just one attack after another until it seemed like you never could get completely well again, uh, that can lead to COPD as well. But most people, you know, the most common have been uh, cigarette smoking. You need uh, at least 10 years of smoking a pack a day. You know, a lot of people have smoked somewhat, uh, particularly as a kid, they tried it out, may have smoked for a little while, and quit. So the question comes up, how much exposure do you, do you need to be a candidate for COPD? Uh, well, different people uh, have different degrees of susceptibility to anything happening. So some people can smoke three packs a day until they're 90, and they have normal lung function. Other people smoke a lot less than that, and they develop COPD when they're 40. Uh, but the general, the general rule is it should be at least 10 pack years. So a pack year is a pack a day for 10 years. So more or less 10 pack years. So that would be 20 years of smoking half pack a day. Um, so you do need a substantial exposure. You're not going to get COPD from having tried out uh, you know, part of cigarettes during the time you were in college. Occupational causes are also very uh, prominent, uh, particularly if you work in areas where you work with doing very dusty work all the time. Um, people who load and unload uh, in, uh, agricultural areas, people who are handling bulk grain, where they're working in loggers or loading rail cars or unloading rail cars, and you have this mountainous uh, stream of uh, rain that's coming out, and the people that have come to supervise this are standing in a cloud of dust, breathing it all the time. People who work in enclosed areas, in construction and demolition, where they're breathing dust, and not wearing respirators. So if you work a lifetime in very dusty areas, then you're also likely to develop COPD. Are we still having problems with the microphone? Yeah. You want me to hold one instead? So actually, it's up more. Push it up more. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. 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 Y
you lose function a lot faster than you continue smoking. So if you quit smoking, uh, it does help. And some people will, will expect, well, if smoking caused the COPD, and if I quit smoking, I should get better. Well, the average person who does that will get a little bit better in the first year, but then they start getting worse. Um, but the, the real benefit is that as the years go by, you lose lung function at a slower rate than if you continue smoking. So it's always helpful to quit smoking uh, if, uh, if you're a smoker with COPD, no matter how bad lung function uh, has power. Do they have yeah, there are all kinds of programs for smoking, uh, ranging from uh, medications. You know, you have Chantix, uh, Propion, also called Wellbutrin or Zyban. Uh, you have uh, nicotine replacement. Some of, some forms of it are prescriptions. Some forms of it are over the counter. Uh, all of them help people who really want to quit smoking make the process easier. Uh, there are there's hypnosis. Uh, there's adverse condition. Uh, there are all kinds of uh, programs that uh, are worth a try. The ones that are proven to be beneficial are the ones that uh, are the three medicines that I mentioned. But that doesn't mean that you have to use one of those things. If you survey people who have quit smoking, most people quit smoking when they decide that they want to do it. You know, it's only about 10% of people who quit smoking use any kind of method or adjunct other than deciding that they, that they want to do it. It's a funny kind of a mental process. Something clicks in your mind and you say, well, that's it. I'm just not doing this anymore. And uh, you wonder, well, how is your mind different now than it was five years ago when you, when you probably want to quit that too? Sometimes it's very hard to quit that But for each person, uh, it, uh, you just reach a stage where you just decide, well, I'm just not doing it. Maybe uh, somebody who's close to you uh, develops a serious illness from smoking. Maybe you get older enough, you begin to realize that you're not going to live forever and you better do things to take care of your health. It didn't seem so important when you were younger. Uh, but uh, I've had people tell me that they might have quit smoking when they raised the price of another nickel. They just weren't going to pay it. <laughs> and I think, well, you know, nicotine is addicted and they've been practicing this habit. 40 years, and they were paying on the You know, so a lot of things don't make sense when you try to put them into words, but uh, uh, nevertheless, people quit successfully, mostly on their own when they decide that the time has come that it's important for them to do it. So I think what doctors do, and anybody in smoking cessation counseling, uh, the most important thing you can do is to get people to think about it, to say, you know, do oh, you think that you might quit someday? Uh, and if so, then what kind of thing would make you decide that now might be the time? And uh, the worst thing you can do is not think about it. The worst thing you can do is you put it in the back of your mind and say, well, I'll kind of deal with this sometime, but not now. Because it's easy to say that to yourself over and over and over again, and then the years go by and the decades go by. And, uh, if you can keep it on the, keep it on the agenda and think about it and have to decide about it, then the whole process goes. Uh, the medicines all help to the extent of about doubling the success rate of 